Uh, let me focus on the theme of my lecture, which is India's <clears throat> long search for prosperity. India has a very uh, peculiar nature, which is constant in the way we evaluate her uh, wealth and prosperity. It has always been known for immense uh, collections of gold and silver and, and pearls and diamonds from ancient times. Uh, and of course, the, the Mughals were very rich and other kings have been very rich. So there is the idea that India has been prosperous in the past and was always prosperous. At the same time, we also know that the ordinary person's life was very ordinary and poverty has always been a part of uh, Indian life. Uh, so India's total income is always large. I have given some numbers, but you can look them up in Google. Uh, India's total GDP, for example, is the sixth largest in the world, but it's per capita income is 150th or something like that in the ranking of, of the world. This is a paradox I want to pursue. And India, because of its large population, can boast of a large amount, large income. But that income is very badly distributed. There are even today in India, many billionaires, many unicorns, the stock markets are booming uh, and uh, people are talking about growth rates of 10% or, or whatever it is. But the condition of, let us say, uh, the migrant laborers, you may remember how during the lockdown last year, about 200 million uh, migrants who had gone to work in urban areas like Delhi, uh, away from, they walk all the way from Bihar to Delhi uh, for the job, and they all had to walk back. Now, when you saw that condition of uh, the, the migrants, you wondered what's going on. Are we a country of unicorns and billionaires, or are we a country of uh, poor migrants? Now, this, this, uh, this paradox has stayed for a long time. We are about to enter the 75th year of independence. Now, at the start of the journey in 1947, early 1947, January 47, before we became independent, Jawaharlal Nehru, the then prime minister, held the Asian conference. India was going to be the leader of Asia and he invited other countries, including China, China and other uh, countries, Indonesia, uh, so on. And he basically wanted to be, uh, you know, he was an Asianist. He wanted to have India as a leader, the top country. It was, after all, the largest colony uh, of, of the British Empire, and everybody thought India would lead. At that time, India and China were in very similar conditions. Uh, they were, again, large total income, sole per capita income. Then for about 40 years, India did not grow very much at all. I mean, very sincere people were in power. They had their theories, they had their ideas from, from the Soviet Union, from the British socialism, or, or whatever it was. We had, we had economists who are trained abroad, quite clever people. But somehow, for the first 40 years after independence, India's GDP growth was very, very low. It was about 1% per capita, which is very low. It was, it was sort of a jokingly called the Hindu rate of growth uh, because it was, it was sluggish and it has nothing to do with Hinduism or anything like that. It is a joke among economists. Now, China, surprisingly, had the same kind of problem, but China's problem was to deliberate what I call fantasy economics of Mao Zedong, who was a leader of China, and, and he sort of thought that China could over, uh, catch over with the UK in, in, in five years' time in steel production. He had all kinds of fantasy ideas, all of which failed, and China was not only stagnant, 
but enormous uh, cost in terms of deaths of 40 million people, the largest famine ever known in global history was uh, took, took, took place in China. Then at about four, you know, 40 years after independence, sort of late, uh, sort of in the 1980s, in India, late 1980s, in China, beginning of 1980s, suddenly the psychology changes. India decides that it is going to to open up to the world, it is not going to have uh, customs and tariffs and uh, and regulations. It's going to go out. And uh, Narendra as prime minister in 1991, along with Manmohan Singh, his finance minister, opened up India to international trade, and suddenly Indian growth story changed. So since 1991, for let's say for the last 30 years, India has grown you know, at a better rate than it used to grow before. Not steadily, there are ups and downs, but better better than before. China had the same sort of uh, transformation. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was the new leader of China in, uh, in the early 80s, uh, you know, a long time communist uh, person. He basically, rejected all the philosophy he had learned about communism being good, capitalism being bad and all that, and suddenly changed the path of Chinese economy by, by adopting capitalist policy with the Communist Party government. And China's growth has been spectacular. China is the second largest economy in, uh, in the world. And I have given the numbers of per capita income. China, China is very high up, you know, in, in the in the two-digit category of ranking. I mean, it's it's around about you know 90th uh, in terms of per capita income. It is it is a it's really a miracle. And not only China and India, in Asia, countries like South Korea, which was also a colony of the Japanese. Uh, for many years. South Korea is now even richer in terms of per capita income than China. Singapore, Taiwan, uh, even Indonesia. Now, we have to ask the question, what is it that is holding India back? Now, I, I'm sorry to be negative about this, but I think we have to inquire why after 75 years, India is a laggard in Asia and not a leader in terms of per capita income. Okay, a very, very narrow uh, focus I'm taking. Now, I think uh, historically, you know, only two parties have, have had any, uh, any uh, say in ruling India, Congress and BJP. Between them, they have more or less ruled for 70 out of 75 years. I either on their own or in a coalition. And, you know, although people exaggerate the differences, they are very similar in outlook. And I'll tell you what they are similar in. Congress started with all sorts of what I'd call super, economic superstitions. One economic superstition was that an independent India had to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, not rely on on foreign countries, foreign investment, uh, foreign experts had to be all all Indian, which is a, which is which is an economic superstition because from the beginning economics has said division of labor is good, people should specialize, international trade is good because you can make what you are best at, and others can make what they are best at, and then you can exchange. It's no good trying to grow bananas in the UK uh, or or coconut because the, you know, it's, it's not a suitable climate. Similarly, it, it would not be very good to, to do some things uh, in, in the Indian climate, uh, which, is, which is done easier in, uh, uh, in, in other climates. But in a sense, the nationalists at that time wanted to have just no, no foreign trade, no foreign influence, because they had been traumatized by British rule in India. So that was one fallacy, and I'm I'm afraid uh, I'm so, I'm sorry to say that the same idea continues, although in slightly different form, with the idea Atmanirbhar Bharat. Why does any country have to be Atmanirbhar? 
I live in the United Kingdom. United Kingdom is not Atmanirbhar. United States is not Atmanirbhar. No economy can be Atmanirbhar and prosper. You prosper by cooperation, trade, division of labor, and things like that. But you know, ideas uh, ideas are hard to hard to fight. Another big idea that we have, which is uh, which is an obstacle, is a myth that many many other nations have. And I, especially among uh, ex-colonies, people, countries which are colonies of the British Empire or the French Empire or whatever. Idea is we were once very rich, but now we are poor because the foreigner robbed us. There was a drain of wealth out of our country and the foreigners took everything away and left us with nothing. It's a very strong myth. So uh, the first generation of leaders, Nehru and others, thought as soon as the British are gone, we'd be all right because the drain will stop. All our wealth will be with us and then we can prosper. Uh, indeed, uh, there was something called National Planning Committee uh, uh, in, in India. And they had thought that in the first 10 years, they would increase Indian income fivefold, five times. Uh, what what it was, but the British left, and there was no there was no uh, drain, uh, you know, the stopped drain to profit from, because in a sense the prosperity of a country doesn't depend upon gold and silver and this and that. It depends upon the productivity of its ordinary workers. That is the key, and that depends upon good education, good health and ease of movement across the country. Now, that is what we have not achieved uh, as, a, in a, as an example of uh, uh, the migrant workers that I said to begin with. We don't really have facilities for easy movement for ordinary uh, sort of poor or low income workers. They take the brunt of all the defects of uh, the weakness of Indian economic growth. Yes, things have improved a bit. I would not, I would not deny that. But we are still, India is still a laggard in Asia. A few improvements, let me admit. For the first time in our history, the number of women in the population is higher than the number of men. For the first time. All these years, women have been badly treated. There has been you know, fetal, uh, you know, killing of fetuses if, if there were if there baby girls. There were starving of baby girls and general neglect of girls and, and women. At last, after 75 years, justice is being done to women. Justice is also being done to Dalits and, uh, and basically uh, OBCs. Historically, they were the last in the queue. Now, at least thanks to the democracy and political parties agitation, there has been some improvement in Dalits and OBC's uh, status, but still there is a lot of time to go for. And I've just uh, seen some facts that child malnutrition has decreased substantially in the last 10 years, uh, due to what is called the new welfareism of uh, the Narendra Modi government. You know, these are good things. Economics is not just about income. It's also about health and education and, and gender equality. Uh, and so we have to celebrate that. So let me leave with one, uh, one thought. You people are the future of India. You're an IIM you are going to be among the more prosperous, rich decision makers. When you make your business decisions, remember that there is an impact on other people as well, especially the poorer people. And India should strive as much as possible, not only just for billionaires and unicorns, which are all very good things, but they should also uh, care about the last in the queue until they, as Mahatma Gandhi said, remember the last person in the queue and then India will prosper. Thank you very much.